So you've worked long enough in the business to now do a story about new body parts <laughs> coming off last Sunday. Well, it's uh, <clears throat> uh, what, what I find interesting about it, I mean, in a really personal way, right. is that uh, uh, particularly at this point in my life where I, I feel like a walking ret retrospective, hmm. uh, that you, we're really dealing with, uh, I believe, how our lives are going to be lived in the future. We're beginning to do that now, uh, and I think that the biotechnology is such that it's going to change uh, not just our lives, but how uh, all medicine, I think, is uh, going to be practiced in, the, in this so-called regenerative medicine of finally understanding how the body really works so and what can be done to manipulate it to work even better. I would imagine after all these years, nothing really surprises you when it comes into the office in terms of ideas. Uh, does that one come to you, or is that some work that you've done or an area that you've been interested in, and you go to them and say, hey, we need to do something on this? I've got, I've got a couple of extremely bright uh, young people who wor I work with, and one of them came to me with that story, and uh, I was dubious because uh, We've all experienced the so-called medical mir miracles that turn out to be not, not so miracles. miraculous. <clears throat> and uh, the more I read and the more I looked at what was going on, I realized that we are on the threshold of something of, of immense importance. Hmm. And as I say, I think that, that we are just beginning to, or they are just beginning to understand how this peculiar thing called the human body, uh, this miraculous thing called the human body, how it really works. Now, we, of course, know you from your work for years and years on television, and so the only appropriate place to start the evening of discussion, of course, is talking about art, your passion for making art, your passion mm -hmm. about reporting on art. So let's start there. Where, where did it come from? Did it, did it start in your home growing up in Canada? Uh, I, I was drawing as long as I can remember, uh, uh, drawing or painting or messing about with uh, plasticine or plaster, uh, and still um, it's, a, it's a wonderful habit that I've not been able to break. Hmm. So when you're traveling around the world and covering stories and not always covering them in a nice hotel <laughs> where you can sit down at a place, did it, did it ever provide some solace to you at times when there were kind of troublesome times in terms of reporting? Yeah, I always carry I always carry a small uh, set of watercolors and paper and brushes, uh, <clears throat> enough you know that I can practically keep in my pocket. Uh, yeah, I'm always ready to paint. Uh, I don't always do it. Uh, but the the other thing about uh, the art that is a, a lot of fun for me is the art world, which is a, uh, a wonderful world uh, for the most part. And it's also a kind of, uh, I don't want to say freak show, <laughs> but maybe I should say freak show. Well, there you go. Uh, That's good. That much of the art world is. Uh, and it's also <clears throat> in this, uh, the age of gullibility, the age of the Madoffs and all of that, Right. in which you know, people get taken in. The art world can, it can a section of the art world, it can fairly uh, be said, uh, uh, is ready to believe anything. And, uh, and thus we have so-called installations. It's a word which uh, now permeates uh, the contemporary uh, art scene. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, installations are plumbing. Hmm. <laughs> it's, and now you've not been shy in your, as we, we actually have a piece of material of yours that we can bring out. Sid? Um, this was uh, a response. Okay, so uh, you saw it maybe on the way in. If you can see it at all, on the bottom 
it says, banned from the Whitney. And uh, what is the origin of this piece? It's a collage that I did, uh, I did, became obsessed about that was really based on the response to a story I did in, in the 80s called Yes, But Is It Art? <laughs> Actually, did two stories uh, uh, <clears> on <throat> contemporary art. And uh, the outrage it caused, it was remarkable. I think it was, it, that story, those stories produced more mail than any, certainly any story that I'd ever reported mm -hmm. uh, on 60 Minutes. Maybe on the, the entire broadcast, I don't know. But uh, I, would, I was condemned and vilified in the New York Times and the Village Voice and by any number of curators and even directors of museums uh, here in the city, which was great fun, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the gatekeepers of, uh, of art, and particularly contemporary art, uh, are almost all humorless, and I understand that because they're 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 uh, their job, their tenure hangs on being serious about stuff that uh, uh, I think is a joke, mm -hmm. and I think I, many agree with me, and they have to either they either are just born as gullible as that or uh, have a remarkable power to willingly suspend disbelief. So in a piece like that, when you say, is it art, um, is there a line that you feel you can approach in terms of we're doing a story about modern art or since you have such a passion for the subject, uh, is it kind of inherent that by asking the question your voice is being heard in that story. I don't know how to answer that, I, honestly. Um, I, I think, for example, someone like, like most of the successful artists or the successful people in this, the ones I'm talking about, mm -hmm. um, have a remarkable talent for marketing. And I think, and, and that's really what has become the most important quality for a contemporary art artist, is how to market himself. So you have someone like Damien Hirst, who is completely without talent. <laughs> <laughs> or, and completely without imagination. Um, completely without craft. Uh, is a remarkable success. Um, Is there any chance he's watching tonight at one of the synagogues? <laughs> I doubt that very much. <laughs> uh, the, perhaps from a mortuary where he likes to work. Uh, but, and, but let's take another one, uh, Jeff Koons. And Jeff Koons, whose work I'm totally indifferent about, except he did one brilliant, and I don't know if you may have seen it, uh, a brilliant sculpture, the, the puppy. Are you familiar with it? I am not. It's, it's, it's a topiary puppy. It's about four stories high mm -hmm. and is remarkable. And it's, it, it is a remarkable piece of art, and I think that Jeff Koons should be honored uh, for that. It is a truly remarkable piece of contemporary art. And all you have to do is watch people who are watching it, and you get that is art. Mm. That is, there's no question. Uh, Richard Prince is another one artist who I do not understand. Uh, he does nurses and nurses and more nurses. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Ryman, who mm. does various shades of white, <laughs> period. Um, uh, the art world in New York was not amused uh, when I suggested that he was the uh, favorite artist of Benjamin Moore. <laughs> <laughs> so shocking that they would take that the wrong way. <laughs> we have some clips. 
Let's move on to some clips. We have, obviously, there are hundreds of stories we could talk about. We've chosen a few. Let's show the first one. If we could have the first clip, please. Traveling around this country, that people are terribly shy, particularly the men. Among ourselves, we think that it's the natural way to be, not to sort of speak out. It's easy to say that from coming from another country, you think of it as shyness, and it probably is, yes. What do they do about this clinical shyness, this almost terminal melancholy? They come to places like this, there are 2,000 of them in the country, pay their 50 markers, that's about $12 and take part in what has become a kind of national obsession, the tango. It's difficult to understand and impossible to exaggerate the importance of the tango Finlandia. Tango Finlandia. What what year was the piece? Early early nineties. Uh, yes, possibly about nineteen ninety. I forgot, but it. Well, I just found it remarkable. You, in uh, it, the Finns, who are uh, the, among the most dour and melancholy people you will find, it is partly to do with climate and just I, they are just very very. Shy. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, I did a wonderful test. I got on the bus, a uh, city bus, and I just walked up and down the uh, center aisle with a cameraman, and I was looking at people, trying to make eye contact with people. They will not make eye contact with you. They're very, very shy people, and yet they are obsessive about this rather sexy dance. But it being in Finland, all of the music is in a minor key. It's very <laughs> sad. Uh, it's a very sad tango. Uh, and there are these tango halls uh, that some of them are only open at lunchtime, so that people will grab a sandwich and go and tango for 45 minutes before mm -hmm. going back to work. Uh, it, it's just one of those glorious oddities. Uh, in the countryside, we saw people with a with a car pulled over to the side of the road, and the, the windows down, and the radio on full blast, and they were tangoing on the on the shoulder of the road. Hmm. Um, stories like that are the are the stories that really excite me, because it's not their story; they're the unexpected, right. and you and. As a writer, you can have a lot of fun with it. Uh, and I had some Finnish friends here who, when they saw the piece, called me and said, I saw all my cousins on television. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next one. We move from Finland to Italy. Giuseppe Verdi did wondrous things in his life, and in death, he did more. He kept these happy few on the stage, gave them an afterlife of curtain call. To an artist, and from an artist, there is no greater gift. No one ever said that opera or old age is easy. And there was a piece called Casa Verde? It was called Curtain Call, mm -hmm. and it was about the Casa Verde. And Giuseppe Verdi, uh, who was a remarkable man, and a remarkably generous man, he, uh, he in his will, uh, he stipulated two things, that there be no public funeral, and that the Casa Verdi, his house, which was a, a very prominent, important house in, in Milan, um, should become a home for destitute or, or just lonely uh, uh, 
members of, of the various operas, of any opera company, particularly any opera company in Italy, and there are many, mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely free to, for, and everyone from the stars to members of the chorus to members of the orchestras even. And it is a house, a wonderful house of music because you go in that place and you hear these once great voices. The, there was a woman who was going over her own photographs, mm -hmm. for a brief shot. That is uh, Sara Scuderi. Sara Scuderi, who was born in 1900, I think she was 86 when we, uh, when we did that. So it must have been about 1986. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, she was the, the star of La Scala in uh, the 20s, 30s, and maybe even the early 40s. Mm -hmm. um, and she, <laughs> in the dining room of Casa Verde, there is a pecking order. And members of the chorus only sit members of the chorus. <laughs> Soloists have their own seats, and the stars, the true stars, sit alone. And, and they may ask someone to join them, but you do not sit down. With them. Um, and they perform. They continue to perform. Uh, uh, I wish we could have showed more. This is one of my favorite stories of all time, because the, here, here you have this group of remarkably talented people who have maintained their vitality right to death. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a wonderful thing to witness. And they continue to perform in Casa Verde. There was a, the end shot, the end sequence of that story was the entire uh, chorus uh, singing Nessun Dorme. It was just the most wonderful moment. As I mentioned at the top, you are known for your writing. You worked in newspapers in Canada and in Great Britain and the CBC. Uh, was there someone along the way who impressed upon you? There are a lot of people on the air, but there aren't a lot of people on the air who really know how to write. Or was it something that was stress at home? No, I think it's something that you learned uh, going along. I mean. I decided at some point that just writing what I would call then wire service copy, that for general use copy, right. was ne really not why I wanted to do this work. Uh, you know, I wanted to make discoveries about myself in the course of making discoveries about uh, human nature and uh, what was happening in the world. So I was determined to I don't know to take the bare bones of a good story, mm -hmm. uh, report it, but try and report it in language that uh, people would not only understand but either be amused by or uh, be teased by in some way uh, that they would want to know more about the story. So, uh, and that became a habit, really. Did you ever feel pressure along the way, even after reaching tremendous success with 60 Minutes, ever any suggestions from inside like, oh, you know, can you kind of not tone it down, or I wouldn't say dumb it down, but maybe I am saying dumb it down. Well, look, I also made another discovery in uh, and it's a motto I really try to live by. It's everybody needs an editor. Right. Everybody needs an editor. <laughs> so I've been slapped down, yes, by lots of editors, uh -huh. and I fought back. <clears throat> and uh, I, I've changed stuff, not in the sense of toning it down, right. but maybe reducing it by one adjective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read a quote. Um, Perhaps it's even correct, since it's on the internet, so you never know. <laughs> Something to the effect of, you're not real fond of knowing about the uh, 
about the, uh, the thoughts or the opinions of our movie stars or our celebrities in terms of the way they feel the, uh, about, about the world. Um, well, let's lead into the next clip because this is one of my favorite pieces from the last couple of years. If we could roll the, uh, the next clip, please. Mary's earthiness won her rave review. After a sizzling portrayal of Cleopatra and spilling her tea, she was invited to join the Royal Shakespeare Company. She dazzled audiences with her talent and blatant sexuality in modern and classical roles. The Lord grows her lips so far, my lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship. And then there were the early films. Most of them turkeys, most notable for Amira taking her clothes off. We call it getting your kit off in England. This is getting your kit off. Oh, yes, yeah, uh, I'm famous uh, for getting my kit off in England, yeah. The sex queen of Stratford, the thinky man's crumpet. Mm, oh, yes, stuff yes. Stuff going around. Yes. Did it get to you in any way? It did used to get to me, but I just kind of ignored it which I'm still doing to this day, Molly. It's still hanging around. And you're still doing it? I'm still doing it. As recently as age 58, Miriam took it all off again for Calendar Girl. Hmm. Going in, do you know, all right, there's something different about her. There are a lot of famous actors and actresses in the world. There's something, something about her that's going to make this really compelling. I, tr I have a kind of rule of thumb on, on you're right, what you, what you said in the, earlier. Uh, actors don't really impress me as subjects for, for a story unless, or, or any, any performer, unless they're at least as interesting as their talent. And because they don't write those plays, they don't write those movies, they, they perform and they're brilliant performers and they're brilliant at being someone else. Mm -hmm. But when they're themselves, are they as brilliant as they're when they're being someone else? That's really the question. And she's one of them. I mean, she is so much fun and she is so uh, uh, really wonderfully self-critical. She's uh, probably her, her toughest critic. And she has, swears like a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> How bad could it be? Uh, the stories that, are, are, that take place in Europe, do you think you have a special feel for them growing up in Canada, working in Great Britain, having worked in Europe a lot in your early years? I love working in Europe, uh, uh, large, uh, for, largely because I, I'm steeped in European history. I mean, and have been since I was a kid. I mean, I've always been engaged in, in, uh, in for my own amusement in European history. So that part of it uh, appeals to me. And uh, to be that close, you know, with spending time in Rome and spending time in Paris and mm -hmm. London and Vienna, uh, you know, my roots are in Europe. Uh, most of our roots are in Europe, aren't they? And uh, uh, so, yes, uh, I, I, do, I feel a special affinity mm -hmm. for the stories that I've covered uh, there, bo both in England and on the continent. My mother was English. Uh, my mother was of East End Cockney. And um, so a sp special affinity there. And I lived in England for a long time. Um, and I am Canadian, and so there is a French component to being Canadian. Um, and my father was from Austria, so I have a, a real... Uh, my father was from Austria and, and, and uh, lived to a wonderful age of 102. Uh, and uh, all his life, he, he uh, was a great, great admirer of uh, Emperor Franz Joseph who he felt was the, the, really the last and maybe the only great unifier mm -hmm. of Europe. Uh, and uh, so I, I have, as 
I am deeply rooted in that culture. Yeah. We have one last piece of video. This is not a piece of video from 60 Minutes, but it is a rather famous piece of video. If we could roll it, please. He has TV News with Walter Cronkite. This is what the war in Vietnam is all about. It first appeared that the Marines had been sniped at and that a few houses were made to pay. Shortly after, an officer told me he had orders to go in and level the string of hamlets that surrounds Can Mi Village. The women and the old men who remained will never forget that August afternoon. Oh, damn it, we're in the middle of this guy. We seem to be pinned down by snipers. One, possibly two, armed personnel carriers that preceded us in here have been blown. One behind us is a dead trooper in it. That's a famous piece of video, the first piece of video, uh, and it's considered one of the first times that America really saw that part of the Vietnam War. Uh, can you tell me just the specifics of it? Were you, were you that morning when you decided, how did it, was the decision to go out with that, with that unit? When you had the footage afterwards, how did you get it back? Uh, we, I was, the, uh, was running the bureau in Saigon, mm -hmm. uh, but we kept a sub-bureau in Da Nang, up in the, the first core of Vietnam. And uh, we took turns uh, working out of the Da Nang Bureau, spent a week or so in Da Nang, and I was up there doing my turn. Uh, uh, and, the, and that first core was, was the territory of the, of the, of the uh, Marines. Uh, and I went around to various Marine posts to find out what operations were going on, and one of those posts, the colonel said, well, we're going out tomorrow at five in the morning on a search and destroy mission. Would you like to come along? And I said, sure. We went along. I had no idea what we would, what we would finally encounter. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, it wasn't a search and destroy mission. It was a destroy mission, and uh, they went in and uh, using uh, napalm, uh, not napalm, uh, flamethrowers mm -hmm. and lighters and matches uh, and simply uh, leveled. It was really, Camnay is, is, is a string of hamlets, so Camnay 1, Camnay 2, Camnay 3, I think there were four at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing was happening all along this string of hamlets. Um, it's not perfectly clear why they went in and did it, but one of the causes, one of the reasons uh, I subsequently learned was uh, that the district chief, the Vietnamese district chief, wanted the village punished um, for not paying taxes to him, not to the central government, to him. Uh, and I, that's uh, I believe in the end was exactly why we went in. He, uh, he didn't tell that to the uh, to the Marines. He told them uh, that it was a Viet Cong village. Right. Did and you have a sense as it's going on once you've retreated? To to, to some safety and some, some quiet uh, later in the day or that night, did you know how potent the footage was? I knew it was strong. I did not realize it would have the kind of effect. But you must understand that in 1965, uh, the communications with, with New York were abominable. You couldn't make phone call, certainly. Uh, you could, and, and we had a radio feed every day and it was only usable about maybe once or twice a week when the weather conditions were such that the transmission would, was audible either way. So communication was off, really terrible. Um, we, there were communications within Vietnam. We, we, had, we had a military phone in our office so we could talk to various parts of the country, but you couldn't talk to the states. So. I didn't get the feedback on the effect of this story for days, for a couple of days. 
And it took a couple of days for the story to get there, too, by the way. You, you of course, chopped the film, you wrote the story, you put it on a plane, and off it went, and would end up in Los Angeles and, uh, or Paris. And then uh, it was pre-satellite, and then it would be transshipped to New York. Hmm. And, and from L.A., they could put it on a circuit to New York, uh, but they only did that on important stories. Right. Um, so it really took probably four or five days by the time I, uh, I got feedback. And I really, the first feedback I got was from the U.S. Embassy, not from CBS. Uh, they had pretty good communications. <laughs> <laughs> Some of that feedback came right from the White House. So I'm always intrigued by people who are in positions that 99.9% .9 of us will not be in. And having the President of the United States, no matter who that President is, uh, be upset with you, beyond upset. Well, uh, President Johnson was extremely upset. And he called Frank Stanton, who was then the President of CBS, and said in more colorful language, uh, Frank, uh, your man out there just defecated on the American flag. He didn't say defecated. <laughs> uh, no, and there, wa there was a, a very strong reaction. I was investigated rather ineptly, by the way. Um, the, uh, they got in touch with... Uh, I, I, guess the FBI got in touch with the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is the, the secret intelligence service in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, to find out what kind of uh, person I was, what books I read. Uh, the, but really weird questions like, what books, you know, the, were they, did they think I kept a copy of Das Kapital in my <laughs> pocket or something? I don't know. Uh, one of the things I've, I've found, uh, discovered in all these years of working, covering all kinds of stories, uh, particularly Cold War stories, is the remarkably, how remarkably bad intelligence is, uh, military intelligence, political intelligence, uh, uh, and not just by the U.S., by the Russians and by everybody else who practice it, the, the craft. It is... It, there have probably been only one or two major intelligence coups in the last 60 years. You know, one was the, the Russian coup of having five, <laughs> five uh, very valuable spies at the very top of British intelligence. Uh, and I honestly can't think of another one. Hmm. Um, uh, I, I got a call from, from a... a acquaintance in Washington just the day before yesterday who uh, did an F uh, freedom of information search, uh, not on me, but on someone else, uh, who he discovered I had interviewed. Well, there were 16 CIA, this is totally illegal, by the way, you know, the CIA is not supposed to be uh, spying on, on American citizens, mm -hmm. 16 CIA agents assigned to follow me and the crew I was working with around Washington for three days. And uh, all I can think of is that it was an exercise of kind of junior G-men because the spelling is atrocious. <laughs> the, the place, the hotel we were staying in, they got wrong. Um, the story we were doing, they got wrong. Uh, they got, I was working with a producer named Phil Scheffler, uh, and for the life of them, they couldn't find out his name, so they, <laughs> uh, At least these guys could have done is got you coffee Well, they could have, like, all they had to do is make a phone call and call yeah. CBS and say, what's the name of that guy with the glasses and the beard who's working with Morley Safer in Washington? I mean, it was just remarkably inept. When you've covered war, when you've been shot at, when you've watched guys die, uh, subsequently 
does it have a tangible effect on how you do any type of story on, on, a, on a daily basis? Of course. I, I don't think you can watch uh, uh, a young man die barely out of their teens um, and see their not just one or two, but piled up corpses mm -hmm. and not be affected. And I, I, look, I spent a couple of years in Vietnam and, and uh, I have memories that I will never, ever, ever be able to erase. I mean, it's, it's how can one? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've kept up with a few of the people I've you know, of the military people I've known out there. I took a lot of heat for the kind of coverage I was doing, but very little from the, from the troops themselves. It's interesting. The guys who actually fought the war uh, are, much, are much easier on me in a certain way. Uh, the other thing that is quite interesting to me is the uh, the ease with which uh, politicians send young men off to war, and in almost every case they have never been near war themselves ever in their lives. And I think he, that those who have uh, who have known it uh, mm -hmm. tend to at least pause before making those decisions. And covering in Vietnam, was it a, were there daily ethical and moral decisions in terms of the coverage? Should we show this? Should we not show this? Is this newsworthy? Is this not newsworthy? It was the nature of how we covered the war that we didn't have to make those decisions. Those decisions were made back, back here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of covering a war live was just out of the question. Uh, and I think that, that now those decisions, uh, the guys who are covering Iraq and Afghanistan uh, have to make those decisions in the field because they're, they're sending in live feeds. Um, I mean, uh, I, I don't, uh, there's no, one doesn't agonize over those decisions. You obviously would not show the face of a, of a, of a dead uh, soldier. Right. Um, and, uh, or mutilation, at least I wouldn't. Right. Um, the, the, there's something about the isolation of that moment on a television screen that has, you know, just way too much power, way too much force, and I would be very careful about showing that kind of I have a book in my hand, Morley Safer Flashbacks on Returning to Vietnam. The timing was, what year, 1990? 89, 90, yeah. Okay, why, for, first of all, why at that time? Why was that time right for you to finally go back and, and do this book? Well, for, first of all, because I could, uh, because the, uh, the Vietnamese uh, gave us visas uh, I was very, really anxious to go back to, I wanted, I only knew that place at war. I, I honestly fell in love with Vietnam. It's a most a wonderful country and, uh, rem and remarkable people, uh, people who have been resisting outsiders for centuries. So I wanted to go back and, and know it at peacetime and it was just the most Elevating trip, I can't tell you, uh, to be able to walk, particularly in the countryside, which is gorgeous. Uh, 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 without any sense of the rumbling of armored vehicles, of artillery, of planes, of explosions, of all that stuff of war. To see this country at peace was just 
a great, a wonderful feeling. And uh, they just, the most, the most remarkable thing about uh, the Vietnamese, when, when I went back, when you were trying to talk to people about the war, they weren't interested. Mm -hmm. this, this war was just a little episode in a long and kind of tough history that we've had. We want to move on. And uh, there is so little animosity and rancor about what America did in that part of Southeast Asia. I just, it, it's no sense of revenge, no sense of being owed something uh, for what they suffered. They just want to get on with their lives. Mm -hmm. The real tragedy uh, of that war, uh, to me, is that uh, we were fighting people who admired us. The Vietnamese have a wonderful admiration for the entrepreneurial spirit and they looked up to America as really being this wonderful place of entrepreneurs. We can do what you want. And that's really the, the, the great tragedy. But they hold no grudges. They are the most resilient and yet most stubborn people at the same time. They resisted the Americans, the French, the Chinese, the Khmers. They, are their own people. Hmm. You joined 60 Minutes in 1970, and one thing that's always struck me about uh, the correspondents who've been on the longest, the ones that we know the best through the years, is a certain toughness that you know you're on the biggest broadcast, you know your stories are going to have uh, power and are going to be heard, and <coughs> And almost a sense of, and this might just be in my own mind, a sense of, you know, we're going to report what we report, uh, no matter what the repercussions might be, and you can say whatever you want to me, including the President of the United States in the Vietnam story, and it's just going to deflect off me, I'm going to go about my business the next day. Do you think a certain inherent toughness is required for the people who have gone to your heights in the world of broadcast journalism to be on a program like 60 Minutes, or do you think that comes with the territory after you've covered a Vietnam, after you've sat across from politicians who you know are lying to you and you give it right back to them? I think that you, I think that you have to have been around a while and have uh, taken your licks uh, <laughs> Uh, here and there, uh, I, to uh, to function in this at this at the at the kind of level and what's expected of you by your bosses at CBS. Now, what you also need is a management that's going to support you, and I must say that over the years. And I really don't want to sound like a company man because I am not a company man. <laughs> uh, but over the years, the the support of you know, starting with Bill Paley himself, of, of the news division and of our broadcast has been remarkable. Remarkable. You know, uh, Frank Stanton was ready to go to jail mm -hmm. at one point when they tried to. Uh, uh, find out our sources, uh, not from mine, mm -hmm. not a story I had been worked on, but he was ready to go to jail. He absolutely resisted the pressure of the uh, administration to pull me out of Vietnam, which is, by the way, Time Magazine did not resist when the, when, uh, the Pentagon demanded that David Halberstam be pulled out of Vietnam. They pulled him out. Mm -hmm. um, so. The, the best thing you need, the best thing you can have is a tough management. And we've had, we've been pretty fortunate uh, over the last four decades in that uh, the management has stood by us in virtually every uh, 
nasty moment we've had in the history of the broadcast. Uh, as you get into it, the broadcast takes off, and it's, it is one of the jewels of television, not just news, but in all of television. Uh, and you're doing stories, some of which we saw tonight, and you're on the road a lot, need I tell you. Can you tell me a little bit about that, what that balancing act is like and the notion of sacrifice to, to have this kind of career? Well, let me, let me say, first of all, uh, uh, I'm not on the road as nearly as much as I was. I chose to go on kind of sort of, sort of half time a couple of years ago. Uh, it's not, not that, it's not that R word. Not no. be, not, no, oh, no. No, no, we won't say uh, that R word. No, no, I will not. Uh, I have no intention. But uh, I really wanted more time to do some of the things I want to do. Like, I take April off every year. And uh, the last couple of years, I've gone to the American Academy in Rome and just uh, uh, sketched for a month. To be able to do that kind of thing was really, I really felt it was time. But in the years, in the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, I was probably on the road two-thirds of the time. And you pay a price. Uh, I missed an awful lot of birthday parties, I'll tell you, with my daughter. And I think, to some extent, she's a little melancholy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I am, certainly. Uh, yes, I mean, you, you sacrifice, and uh, is it selfish? Yes. Uh, you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it out of any great sense of mission, believe me. Hmm. You're doing it for your own interest, amusement, self-aggrandizement, money, all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and to some extent, you also, you do it because you got to do it. And uh, that was a bug that I got bit by pretty early on. Um, you know, this is the kind of work I've always wanted to do since I, since I was, I don't know, probably about 16. And I read Hemingway. Uh, yeah, that's what I want to do. Hmm. And Hemingway started out as, a, in fact, worked for a Canadian paper. Uh, for the Toronto Star for a long time. Covered the Spanish Civil War for the Toronto Star. So, yeah, it's, 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 I'm really a very, very lucky man. How many of us, you know, can, have been able to live a childhood dream? That's pretty good. And keep doing. <laughs> some questions from our audience and some questions from the various uh, synagogues that are watching us. Uh, by a satellite uh, from Congregation Beth Emeth. A question from Albany, where happily many of my relatives are watching. <laughs> what is your opinion of the way in which CBS slash 60 Minutes handled the tobacco story? That was not at CBS's proudest moment, mm -hmm. uh, honestly. Um, I was only involved in, in the periphery of that, so I, I don't know the details mm -hmm. uh, and what went on among Don Hewitt, uh, Mike Wallace, uh, and CBS management. And it was in the Larry Tisch ownership, and I don't think it was Mr. Tisch's finest hour. Um, But uh, having said that, I, I don't think it was the broadcast finest hour either. Uh, there were some lapses on everyone's on everyone's part. So to answer the question, it was not it was not the greatest moment for either 60 Minutes or CBS News or CBS in, uh, CBS the company. Here's another question from Albany. Given your interest in biotechnology, what are your thoughts on federal health care reform? <laughs> you want me to get into that? And we have to be out of here by... Uh... <laughs> uh, I'm not going to talk about federal health care reform. I will talk about health for a second anyway. I think that, that access, offering access 
to good medical care is the duty of government, period. That's, I think, uh, we, we, we have as much right to health care as we have to secure it. That's what the government is supposed to be there for. No? To look after it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it is the duty of government to do everything possible to have the population uh, uh, as healthy as, as possible. And uh, so I really don't understand, I don't think there's any question. I don't think there is a debate. Uh, and if you look at most of the world, most of the civilized world, most of the developed world, uh, you will find healthcare systems that people are not ecstatic about, but nevertheless would not change. Uh, I think uh, knowing a little bit about the Canadian system mm -hmm. and having a lot of my family in the, the business of medicine up there, uh, the doctors are not ecstatic about it, but they most of them, for the most part, wouldn't change it. And for one of the reasons is uh, most, uh, an awful lot of them are more int are as interested in doing research and having the time to do the research and looking at and and the well and seeing to the well-being of their patients than having to worry about where the next dollar is going to come from. Mm -hmm. They have a pretty good idea. They all live quite well. Would they like to live better? Of course. Would they like more income? Of course. But they, the system has kind of found a balance. And it, everyone has access to pretty decent medical care. You hear horror stories from some of the advocates against a national health scheme in this country. And they are, there are horror stories in every system. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's a good system that reaches everyone. And the same is true in France, and the same is true in Belgium, and the same is true in Holland, and the same is true in Sweden, and the same is true in Britain, and name it. Um, and no more, I better not say anything. <laughs> Do you think uh, being a Canadian and having such a background in, uh, as you mentioned, European history and ties to Great Britain and to Europe and working there, in a formative age, do you think that has a tangible effect on your reporting on subjects that involve America? I, I, yeah, I think I still cover stories here as a foreign correspondent. Hmm. And I think that's a great value. And at one point I used to say, I think that all reporters should be considered stateless. Um, so I, I don't, th I think that, um, not having the, not sharing in the experience of growing up in this country gives me an advantage. Uh, I'm not emotionally, that emotionally attached to many of the elements within this society that uh, most of my colleagues are. Even after all these years? Even after all these years. Yeah. I think that, in a way, being a Canadian does make you stateless. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you were working in those early years, of those newspapers in, first in Canada, and then in Great Britain, and then the CBC, um, which having spent some time up there, is a ter terrific, uh, terrific operation, what did you allow yourself to dream about? Was that already the dream job? I'm working at a newspaper in Canada, or did you already have a notion that there's a big world out there and I want to go cover it? That, w that was the notion. That's what I wanted to do, right from the beginning. There was a big world out there and I wanted to cover it. I mean, I wanted to work in Paris, and I wanted to work in London, and I wanted to work in all those places, uh, <clears throat> and see the world. and. Uh, have someone else pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a confident guy right from the start, or did you ever have to deal with the element of doubt? Element of? of doubt. And even after 
reaching, coming to CBS and uh, covering Vietnam, covering the Middle East, and then 60 Minutes. Is the notion of doubt of can I do this? Um, is this piece going to be good enough? Does it ever play a role? Oh, early on, sure. Uh, but uh, having tough editors early on I is really a gives I think gives you a really great advantage because uh, it it makes you doubt, and then it makes you angry, and then it makes you want to kill that editor, <laughs> and then you, you want to and you want to kill him by being so goddamn good he's going to have to say, be nice to you. And that's what good editors are for, They're to really treat you like crap until you no longer should be treated like crap. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky in having those kinds of editors. Really tough. I mean, they beat you up. They humiliated you. They, you know, they just ruined your copy. You tore it up, start all over again. And it was, it was wonderful. As we come down the home stretch here, you've been quoted as saying regarding some of the, the, the modern ways we get our news and technology, uh, good journalism is structured, and structure means responsibility. I would trust citizen journalists as much as I would trust citizen surgery. Uh, and uh, imagine that. There was a little bit of a reaction to that on, on the internet. Um, what, what's your thought about it right now in terms of how we are getting news, future of newspapers, and can you see a, a little beacon of light in some of the modern technology that's going to be uh, beneficial to us uh, in, in comparison to that quote? Uh, yeah, I think that, that the mod obviously you, you can't, uh, the, 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 the faster and better you can deliver uh, the news, Obviously, that's that's good, and the more and the more people who have access to it, that's good. All of those things are very good, but it, at the same time, if you want to have some kind of responsibility, if you if you want it, if you want responsible journalism, uh, it you must have that structure. Look, we all bitch and moan about the New York Times. Everyone in this room, about, you know, about how the Times will get it wrong. But the fact is, where would we be without a great paper like that? Mm -hmm. Think about it. That's covering the arts and science and sports and all of the stuff uh, uh, that most of the people in this room and most of the people who are watching this broadcast want to know about. We need that kind of, of structure. It's, and it's in great danger right now. Um, what I don't understand is why the New York Times charges so much for the daily paper and so much for the Sunday paper, but then gives it all away for free the same day. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's what I don't get. Um, and uh, I would happily pay to read. I read the New York Times online every morning. At, uh, I'm up at 5 o'clock. The paper doesn't get to the house till 6.30. And I've read the paper by the time I get the paper. <laughs> uh, but we still take the paper because I, I need that. Yeah. Tactile, whatever. Um, and somehow, I think, the newspaper business will find a way of maintaining that daily newspaper and at the same time be able to stay in business through profiting from the web. Mm -hmm. How they'll do it, I have no idea. I think they started out all wrong by, as I say, by giving it away. Right. And uh, uh, it, is some, it is something that concerns me because television will never, you know, ever be able to do what a good newspaper will do. We just don't have, if you look at uh, the average uh, television report, say from the, an evening news broadcast, mm -hmm. uh, the entire substance in words 
would be probably less than a page of the New York Times. You think about it. So we need that kind of journalism if we're going to be in, in any way an informed public. You just, because you cannot rely on television news, you'll we'll never get the kind of space that we need. And if, and if you go beyond the networks into some of these other networks. <laughs> uh, um, well, I mean, and you like watching freak shows instead of understanding what's happening in the world, then, you know, all, then, then that's fine if that's what you want. But, uh, you know, I think for the most, for the most part, cable news is terrible. All of it really is terrible. And I'm, I'm not talking about you know, big stories that are happening like 9-11 and that kind of thing where you're, you're all glued to right. television. But in terms of, of uh, the kind of reporting we need, we'll never get it from television. It never will happen. I'd like to end on, on two notes. It's not been an easy year for CBS News. Uh, Walter Cronkite and Don Hewitt Walter Cronkite's death obviously uh, engendered a tremendous amount of attention and, and warmth. Uh, but you were there. You would have a drink with him. Uh, forget about the, the big picture and what he meant in, in the place of news in our society. What kind of guy was he like to sit across the table and have a drink with Cronkite him? Cronkite was, uh, I really miss him. He was one of those guys who was always a joy to be with. First of all, he had a wonderful sense of humor and a great mimic, really great mimic. <laughs> um, he was an old wire service guy, and I, you know, the guys that I used to drink with in Reuters well, back in the dark ages. And Walter was an old UPI man, and he still had the, the kind of, uh, of fire horse uh, instincts about getting out and covering the story. Uh, he was great fun to be with. He uh, had, a, up until those last couple of difficult years, a remarkable memory. He could con you know, pull stuff out, but just extraordinary memory. He, uh, you know, he, he Covered all the tough stories. He did cover D-Day. He went on I don't know how many bombing missions, uh, and those bombing missions were no joke. I mean, I think the average life of some of those pilots was what five, ten, six missions, and mm -hmm. they were gone. So he was a tough, uh, tough guy. He uh, was a very good amateur. Uh, a race driver, uh, and, and quite a successful one. Yeah. Did you go out with him? Did no, I never. I never drove with him. Uh, but uh, I messed around with some old cars myself over the years. Now Walter was very, very good. He, he fancied himself as a great sailor, but his best friends will tell you that he really wasn't. Really. He loved at the to memorial sail. service. He loved the, to sail. He talked about it oh, like he, he was. Oh, he loved to sail. He loved uh, the Winty. Uh, he had a series of books all called Winty, which was his grandmother's name. Right. Um, and he loved the sea and loved to be on the sea. But sources tell me he was <laughs> a great sailor. <laughs> okay, so if Walter thinks he's running the show, and behind him is somebody. He was also a, he was also a gadget nut. I mean, he had to have the latest gadget, and at least three of them. Uh, and he was a great technology uh, guy. He understood the technology, which is why he was so uh, uh, enamored of the whole of the space program. And I think, in many ways, Cronkite saved the space program. Because of the attention he gave to it? Yeah. yeah. And when you'd come back from Vietnam and you'd talk to him, would he pick your brain for what's going on there? And Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when he came out to Vietnam, he would, 
you know, when, when Walter traveled to Vietnam the first time, which was in 60, I think it was the end of 65, beginning of 66, uh, I mean, the, the brass out there treated him like God and, you know, and uh, absolutely kept him away from talking to anybody who actually knew what was going on there. And uh, but he, you know, he would come back and back the hotel at night. And always say, now tell me what's really going on. Here. Right, right. He knew he was being, you know, that they were, they were uh, trying to sell him something. And CBS also lost Don Hewitt this year. And Don Hewitt, and Don Hewitt was the father of us all at 60 Minutes. Uh, it was Don's idea. Uh, he pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed to get this broadcast on the air. Uh, and it was, they reluctantly put it on the air. And you know, it was only on every, we, when I first joined 60 Minutes, we were on every other Tuesday against the most successful program on television then called Marcus Welby, MD. <laughs> and we thought that doctor would never die. <laughs> <laughs> And he didn't, they moved us to Sunday. Uh, but, we, and, and uh, Dawn persisted and, and CBS, uh, to its great credit, uh, had the patience to keep us on during those lean years when, you know, every time you, you if you were decided to go out to the story and you'd call, people making contacts, and you'd say, uh, this is, I've worked for 60 minutes. What's that? <laughs> uh, and the moment we stopped getting what's that and getting, I'm gonna put you on hold, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we knew we were gonna be staying on the air. Uh, so the, the, uh, the first, Five or six years were very lean years. And in those years, it was just me and Mike. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing <laughs> three stories a week, and you, you were asking about being on the road. Right. Uh, in, the, in those days, we, you, you, we worked seven days a week, and we probably were traveling five of them. And the other two, on the weekends, we were up all night. We were working right through till Sunday afternoon to get to finish the stories and get them on the air. Those were tough years, believe me. Uh, they was before they gave frequent flyer miles, unfortunately. <laughs> so eventually, I mean, Don Hewitt is kind of the manager of a team that has, has a lot of heavyweights. Uh, there's some particular part of his personality or the, his makeup that, that made it work. Well, Don was a, a, a wonderful combination of, of, of uh, a showman and an, and an old-fashioned front-page kind of editor. Mm -hmm. and that's pretty good. That's a pretty good mix uh, for this funny business called television to have those two sets of instincts of what makes great, what gets him in the tent, and once you get him in the tent. Uh, how to how to tell a story? So Don, Don was Don, Don was genius in that respect. Uh, we had fights. He was not an easy guy to work for, and in, in a funny way, Don didn't respect you until you had to really knock him down. Until there was blood on the floor. <laughs> what was the first time there was blood on the floor? Almost immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Were you able to have a few laughs too? I'm sorry? Were you able to have a few laughs, too? Oh, yeah. He had a wonderful sense of humor, and, and he was a wonderful practical joker, too. And we also played a few, too. Those were wonderful, free and easy days. It was just me and Mike and Don, I'll tell you. Uh, those were great days. I can't repeat anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, An hour and 15 minutes in. Now we're getting to the good <laughs> stuff. I can't, honestly. Well, I'm a big believer in tentacles. When a writer writes something, even say 30, 40 years ago, who knows who's gonna pick up the book tomorrow and be affected by it. A, a musician, an artist, creates something, music, 
200 years ago. They're creating music that's still being listened to today. And so for people like myself and for younger generations who are first getting into the business now or even just thinking about the whole notion of what is news and covering it, 60 Minutes to me is still the standard. Uh, you have set the bar high for the rest of us, and you have been a major part of that. And for that, I thank you. And for tonight, thank you.